Hello everyone and welcome to another session of computational algebraic geometry. Today we're going to look at the space of lines in a surface in P3 from a more theoretical perspective. On Monday we studied the space of lines by constructing a bunch of polynomials that cut out a bunch of points in an affine chart of the Grassmannian. And we looked at the degree of this uh, locus that these things define and said that the degree is the number of lines. And there was a step where we said perhaps we should consider the reduction of this scheme. The goal of this lecture is to understand that when you go through the construction that we did on Monday, the schemes do you, that uh, you get inside the Grassmannian will always be reduced. That means that you can always just compute its degree and then you will get the number of lines. Uh, first of all, of course, this is a computational advantage to know this because it's expensive to check uh, whether or not the scheme is reduced and it's expensive also to reduce it. So we will uh, prove uh, now theoretically that these schemes are reduced. Moreover, we will be able to see a whole lot of ideas that are very common in algebraic geometry. As an excuse, we will learn these ideas in trying to solve our problem. Uh, I should mention that today's lecture will be uh, theoretically much harder than uh, what we have done before. And every now and then I will be pitching it to people who already know what a scheme is, what the spectrum of a ring is, and so on. But uh, I think it will be worthwhile to watch through it and just learn how these arguments are done. And of course, I will be uh, informal uh, when I need to be to make things go faster and smoother. Let's begin. Now I want to begin by making our goal a little bit more precise, and then we will go ahead and talk a little bit about strategy before we start doing the proofs. First of all, I want to take a field. In principle, there are very little restrictions on this field, but today I don't want to deal with a characteristic P, so I'm going to take characteristic zero. So you might take complex field, real field, rational numbers, that sort of thing. If you really want, you need to take characteristic greater than the degree of the surfaces that we'll be dealing with. So characteristic K0, take a polynomial F, homogeneous of some degree D, and I want the surface that it defines to be smooth. Now the object we will be dealing with throughout this lecture is the funnel variety of the surface S. So f of S, this is the space of lines in S. Of course the space of lines inside of S lies inside the space of lines inside of P3 and that's the Grassmannian G24. I'm not calling it a set of lines, a space of lines, so I have a space structure, a scheme structure in mind. And this uh, scheme structure, let me just say right now, together with the polynomials that we cooked up on Monday, uh, but then we will make this clear again uh, throughout the lecture. In fact, the reason I'm interested in this object is basically because I want to understand the polynomials that I cooked up on Monday and I would like to say that these polynomials cut out a bunch of points and these points are reduced. That's our goal. Now first, let me give this its name. Now, it, typically, whenever you have some variety in Pn, you can talk about its uh, Fano variety or Fano scheme, uh, the space of lines inside of that uh, sub-variety of Pn. But it's a privilege call to call this Fano scheme a Fano variety. So that typically implies that this scheme is reduced, and that's what you, I want to say. Now, of course, this, uh, what I just wrote down, especially regarding the dimension, requires the extra assumption that the degree should be at least 3. But when degree is 1 or 2, the structure of f of s is actually rather easy. When degree is 1, for example, our surface is a plane. And the space of lines inside of a plane, we discussed this earlier, is just a dual plane. So it's a plane again, so a funnel scheme has to be two-dimensional. When degree is 2, you get a quadric. Quadric is the product of two lines. It's an isomorphic to a product of two lines. And the only lines in the quadric are the fibers of this product. And so you get two lines, if you want, two lines worth of lines inside of a quadric. And the funnel scheme is of dimension 
1. Degree 3 is also interesting, so this is captured by what we are going to do today. Degree 3, it's again a classical theorem that you get precisely 27 lines. And afterwards, the generic situation is that you do not have any lines whatsoever. In a general, or a, if you want, with probability 1, a random example, but you saw yet on Monday that many of the examples we constructed had lines, even in degree 4. If you've experimented further, you'll have found, again, surfaces that have lines of higher degree, uh, which means what mathematically should be probability 0 is not quite the reality when you're talking about polynomials with rational coefficients and small rational coefficients. So then this scheme, well, I need to amend this statement already. In light of what I just said, in general, when degree is at least 4, f of fs is empty, but when it is not empty, it will always be reduced. So one corollary, and one of the reasons why we're interested in this, is that degree of f of s is precisely the number of lines and defined over the algebraic closure of k. We saw this already when k was the rational numbers, so our polynomial had rational coefficients. Uh, we saw that it was very rarely the case that our lines were defined over q, but uh, we had to go to algebraic extension of q to be able to realize all our lines. And the degree of FOS is going to give us the number of lines, that's what we're interested in. And uh, remember, without knowing what we want to prove, the fact that f of s is reduced, what you have to do is either to check that uh, the scheme you construct is reduced, or uh, to maybe construct this reduction. So these are in principle expensive operations and knowing this a priori, knowing that fs is always reduced, means that you can't skip this uh, expensive operation. Let's talk about the strategy of proof and the outline of this lecture. So the first question is, how do you even check the non-reducedness of something? Especially in such generality, since we won't have explicit polynomials at hand. And the point is not to study k-valued points for our field k, let's say, but instead talk about slightly fatter points. Remember, k-valued points were the solutions to your system of polynomials with entries in k, but we can plug in values in some other commutative ring. And we're, what we're going to do is, instead of using the field k, we're going to use a slight thickening of k. And these fat points will tell us whether or not there is this non-reduced structure. So these fat points are points in what are sometimes called the dual numbers, or k epsilon. So here we write epsilon to designate that epsilon is a very small number, so its square is zero. But it's nothing else than just the one variable polynomial ring modulo the relation epsilon squared. So we will talk a little bit more about this. This is actually a lot of fun, and because when you're talking about k epsilon points, you understand the infinitesimal structure of a point, you get the tangent space of a variety, that kind of thing. So it's, it's very nice that you can capture these concepts by just studying points, but not over a field, but a slight thickening of a point. And then we have to understand what are points in Fs, what are points in the Grassmannian, but not as points in a field, but points in this thickening. So we have to understand fat points in Fs, or in general, fat points in the Grassmannian correspond to a line in space and a slight deformation of it. Of course, we also have to understand what it means to have an infinitesimal deformation. In particular, we will see that it has something to do with choosing normal directions to the line in the space that it lives in. And so I've written it for lines in space. The same thing holds for lines inside of our surface S. I've just reproduced the line above. Everything is the same. Now fat points of Fs corresponds to a line inside of S and a deformation of it, an infinitesimal deformation of it, inside of S. And now, of course, the rest of the lecture has to be about showing that lines cannot deform inside of S, even infinitesimally. So the first step in this direction is to show that infinitesimal deformations of a line are in bijection with the global sections of its normal bundle inside of S,
The normal bundle of LNS, denoted N subscript LS, is isomorphic to just the tangent bundle of S, so all possible tangent directions at all points of S, but uh, restricted to the points on L. Modulo, modulo the tangent directions coming from L. This is the space of normal directions uh, to the line. So this is a vector bundle on the line. In fact, it's a line bundle on our line, and it will be easy to compute its global direct uh, dimension of sections once we understand uh, what is its degree. One thing to mention here is that, of course, the global sections of a line bundle of a vector bundle has the structure of a vector space. Therefore, the space of deformations also has the structure of a vector space, so you can add them and multiply them. I will not get into this, but in fact, these two structures coincide. So the last part of the lecture will be about understanding then the structure of this normal bundle. The normal bundle, as I said, is a line bundle in this case, and L, the line, is just a P1. Therefore, I need to understand which of the line bundles on P1 is this normal bundle, because on P1, a line bundle is completely characterized by its degree. So I just need to understand its degree, and I'm just going to write it like this. This normal bundle is the line bundle on P1 of degree 2 minus D. D, remember, is the degree of the surface. So in particular, this line bundle has no sections. The moment D is at least 3. The global sections of the normal bundle, I write it with this H0 notation, is 0 if D is at least 3. So this is the outline of the lecture and the outline of the proof. And the first step is moderately elementary, and I think it's a lot of fun. The second step is a lot of tautology. We're just going to try to make sense of what should be a point in a Grassmannian, what does it mean to have maybe families of lines. So we're just, I think it's more of a conceptual difficulty. And uh, the problem is, in trying to make these definitions, we'll have to talk about, we'll have to use spectrums of rings to make things precise. But I think you don't need it, so you can just wait patiently, as I say, the spectrum. And the third and fourth steps uh, really do require a little bit of uh, algebraic geometry. So we'll be seeing, I think, the basic constructions, like the tangent bundle, cotangent bundle, the determinants of vector bundles, that sort of thing. Uh, we'll see them in use in drawing our final conclusion. Let's talk about thick points. So this is, will be our main tool to study non-reduceness of schemes or to solution sets of polynomials. Right, so the, I'm going to write D when I remember to write it for the dual numbers K epsilon. I didn't tell you what K epsilon was exactly, so now I will do so here. This is actually a shorthand notation for writing the following. I construct a polynomial ring with a variable called epsilon. So it's just one variable polynomial ring, not, no gimmicks. And then I quotient out by the ideal generated by epsilon squared. That's what I mean when I write k epsilon. It's kind of an agreement that uh, when you use epsilon, you mean this ring. And the fact that epsilon squared 0 should be viewed as that epsilon is so small that its square is negligible. In analysis, you do this very often, and this is the answer in algebra to this construction and analysis. We're dealing with infinitesimal numbers. So despite this lofty goal of studying infinitesimal numbers, the algebraic construction is super easy. Let's see uh, how this actually detects this non-reducedness. For example, I take a polynomial now of x minus 3 squared. So in one variable polynomial ring, I take x minus 3 squared. If you ask for the k valued points of the zero scheme defined by g, then you will see that there is only one solution, namely x equals 3. So let's write this down. Remember, this polynomial defines a scheme inside of A1, and we talked about k valued points. And this k valued point is just 3. But what happens is that, first of all, g is different from x minus 3 itself. We're using x minus 3 squared, so the polynomial is slightly different than the thing that was supposed to define 3. And we notice this when we, you ask for the degree of x. Both your computer will tell you that the degree is 2, and of course the, there's a definition. The definition tells you that the degree is 2. This is a little bit annoying, and uh, this is the problem that we want to avoid at the very beginning. So we want to be able to see the number of solutions and related to the degree. This is when bijection fails. The degree is 2, the number of solutions is 3. 
But now look at the solutions to G over the dual numbers. I plug in a dual number. Of course, a dual number will be of the form A plus B epsilon, where A, B are elements in our field K. And then the rest is algebra. I just expand this polynomial out. Okay, so what you see is that this expression is identically zero when a equals three. What you should notice is that epsilon squared is always zero regardless of the value of b. So this is zero if a is three. This is zero if a is three. So what we see is that when a is equal to three, b can be any number at once. Now, if we were working with the polynomial x minus 3, then you would see that there is no one-dimensional solutions over the dual numbers. The only solution would come from k uh, over using this reduced version of g, b would have to be 0. The fact that we are working with a non-reduced polynomial was a contributing fact to the fact that we have this free parameter of solutions over the dual numbers. And here I'm talking about the solutions to x minus 3 or d and k, and I'm using equality in the obvious sense that the coefficient of epsilon is zero when you're looking at these solutions. Yeah, so this is one way to capture a non-reducedness. Now let's study this a little bit further. Let's take another example now, at least in a higher dimensional ambient space. How about we take the origin inside of A2? So the origin in A2 is defined by the zero set of its two coordinate variables x, y, and what I want to do is to put some non-reduced structure into it. So I'm going to square y, for example. Clearly, uh, the k-valued solutions is when x is 0, y is 0, so we get the origin again, but the non-reduced uh, structure is there and the dual numbers will capture this. So you can just see that this is the only set of solutions. The first coordinate has to be zero and the second coordinate has to have a zero constant part and the epsilon part can be arbitrary again. And now because there's a little bit more structure, I think we can see what's happening a little bit clearer. We're having a little bit of movement, let's say, in the y coordinate. So we're, we have some freedom in the y coordinate and think of epsilon as an infinitesimal number we're allowed to move infinitesimally away from the origin along the y-axis. And let's draw some pictures to see uh, why this should be so. Okay, so I've drawn my plane and the x and the y-axis. Of course, the x-axis is the locus where y equals zero. And if y is allowed to grow larger, then I'm allowed to move away from the x-axis. Now my origin is here, and my equations suggest that I can move away from this origin along the y-axis. So this orange locus should be our x. Of course, the orange part should have been infinitesimally thicker than the blue part, not visibly so. But nevertheless, that's uh, the concept. And here, the idea is that we didn't use y equals 0, we use y squared equals 0. That means we're allowed to move away from the x-axis just a little bit. We took two very simple examples, both of them essentially supported on a point. We made the equations defining them a little bit different than what we would use, so there were, there were squares inside, and we saw that the dual numbers captured this non-reduced structures. There is one more thing. We also want to say that the Fano variety is zero-dimensional when the degree is large. So that's what I want to point out right now, that another thing that dual numbers captures are higher dimensionality. So in particular, they capture tangent directions and non-reduced things have tangent directions in some sense. Let's look at an example now. So let's look at points of A1. Remember A1 of any ring was just isomorphic to the ring itself and if you really want to use polynomials you can also say you know a1 is let's say the zero set of y inside of the plane a2 with coordinates x y and then you can plug in any number you want for x and you have to annihilate the y coordinate so you see that uh, you can also use polynomials anyway so what's for sure clear here is that this thing is much larger than a1 of k these two are not equal because these two are not equal in other words, once again, the dual numbers see some extra structure that is not seen by k, if you want. And what's happening here is that a1 is one-dimensional, so that every point on a1 also allows perturbation. I can perturb any point on the affine line along the line. And that's why every point has this extra tangent direction, and that's what 
A1D is picking up. The moral of this story is that uh, the fact that you have D points that are not K points does not say that the scheme is reduced, but it might also tell you that the scheme has higher dimensional structure. This is perfectly fine for us because we want our Hanover variety to be zero dimensional and reduced, so there should be no dual numbers. We can be aiming for this. Let's now set two exercises for you to play around with. One of them is easy, one of them requires a little bit of uh, more knowledge. Let's now take a hypersurface in AN. And I want it to be smooth. That means the partial derivatives don't vanish simultaneously at any point on the surface. Let's say there's a k-valued point and you pick this point. Let's call it A. It's an n-tuple A1 through An of k numbers. And what I want to say is that decide what are the dual numbers that are supported on this point. Remember, a dual number has this first constant part of, that has no epsilon and a part with epsilon. So I want the constant part to be A1 through An. And you should decide what comes next. What is the linear term allowing a dual number uh, solution? This requires a little bit of fiddling around, but it's very elementary. So you just plug in ai plus bi epsilon and then expand out polynomials. So try it with first univariate polynomials, maybe with bivariate polynomials, and then I think you will pick up the structure that uh, the, in the end result, when you evaluate f at this number, you will have a linear term in terms of epsilon, and this term will involve partial derivatives of f. And then you will realize that somehow you're picking up all tangent directions to x at p. This is your goal is to prove it. If you know a little bit more, then you can be a little bit more ambitious and prove the general case. So now take any scheme, smooth, finite type over k, so essentially a system, <laughs> a solution set to a system of polynomials over k. The goal of this exercise is to pick a point on a smooth variety x and show that all d valued points supported on a are in bijection with the tangent space of x at this point. You'll see that this agrees with uh, everything that we've done so far, even when x was not smooth, when not reduced. So then the definition of a tangent space is slightly different, and you see that uh, this agrees with the uh, non-reduced point 3 that we studied. We took a non-reduced origin in the plane, and there was a sort of tangent direction pointing away from the origin in the y direction. Uh, we then took the affine line, then for any point, we also had choice of an arbitrary epsilon. Again, because the line is one dimensional, you have tangent directions. And the hypersurface exercise that I left you before this exercise was also the same kind of question. This is a little bit harder, but it requires the definition of a Sariski tangent space. So if you know what that definition is, uh, once again, you can uh, figure it out. Just switch to an affine chart, and then I think it will fall into your lap. So we talked about fat points of various schemes very simple ones. So now we're going to talk about a fat point on the Grassmannian. And in principle, nothing changes, but we have an interpretation of what a point in the Grassmannian means. A normal point, a k-valued point of the Grassmannian, corresponded to a line inside of P3. And so we have a similar interpretation of what a fat point in the Grassmannian should mean. It, it should mean something like a fat line inside of uh, P3. And we'll see that uh, there are some restrictions on how we fatten it. So the Grassmannian is intelligent in how it allows us to do that. To make it official, let's take a line, so a point in the Grassmannian. And I will consider it as a k-valued point. So it's the usual point of the Grassmannian. Now, there is no loss of generality if I were to assume that the uh, first Plücker coordinate, the first minor of the matrix representing L, does not vanish on L. If it does, then just pick another minor. So the, what I'm about to say does not uh, change. So suppose this first minor, M12 on L, is non-zero. So 
So we represent L by this two by four matrix as usual. Note that I'm actually, I'm going to just thicken this point a little bit so I can work in a neighborhood of this line and that's very good for us because the neighborhoods were just defined spaces. So this is a k-valued point of some a4 in that sense. That's why this is as simple. It will be simple also to talk about thick point based on L because it just means I make these aij's and add them some bij time epsilon. So this is the kind of line or whatever that is now uh, would be represented by. So these four coordinates and for these coordinates are now in the dual numbers. So now let's try to interpret what this thing means geometrically. And let's begin by what we were not allowed to do when we were thinking of a k epsilon valued point of the Grassmannian. We were not allowed to add epsilons to these 1, 0, 0, 1s, this first 2 by 2 block of our matrix. Uh, of course, it makes a lot of sense when we're trying to parameterize our line to add epsilons there. It makes sense. You know it makes sense. We can write down these two points. It's generates a line, so it, it kind of makes sense. But the Grassmannian, it does not allow us to do it. In that sense, it does not see perturbing these one zeros as a point. And let's try to understand what that means. So one obvious thing is that if I were to add epsilon times the first row into the second row, we know now that this shouldn't change the line, it just changes the way we parameterize the line. And indeed, this was not something that we're allowed to do, so the grass mining doesn't see this point as a new point. If you were to bring it back again to the standard coordinates where the first minor is just 1, 0, 0, 1, first matrix, then uh, you will recover the original coordinates of the line. so that. This sort of fat in the coordinates of the parameterization does not give you a fat point of the grass mining, it gives you a usual k point. So this is Remember, we used two points on L to parameterize L. And what we do is that we move the second point uh, a little bit in the direction of the first point. And therefore this doesn't change the line, but it changes our parameterization. And this doesn't give a new line, it doesn't even give a perturbation of the first line. And so the Grassmannian is correct that this is just the original line, it's a k-valued point of the Grassmannian. When you compute the Plicker coordinates, nothing changes. Now let's carry this idea a little bit further with what we have done uh, above with these bij's. Let me draw my line. Let's take our first point and let's take our second point. And what's happening right now is that I'm changing the points that I'm using to parameterize L a little bit in the direction, not in L. So you, uh, these bij's have coordinates 0, 0 in the first uh, two entries. So what happens is that I have something like I'm adding these two orange arrows to my original points. I've drawn them suggestively as orthogonal vectors, but of course they're not really orthogonal. But what's important is that they're not in my original line. And so they gave me two canonical coordinates, namely 0, 0, star, star, kind of. Uh, they give me a two-dimensional space uh, in which my line will never lie by design. Uh, and I allow to perturb these two points along uh, these two-dimensional space in a parallel direction to this two-dimensional space. So once I've uh, chosen this two-dimensional space, 0, 0, star, star, uh, I can actually say that the normal directions to L are canonically identified with this uh, two-dimensional space. And therefore what I'm doing is essentially choosing two normal directions at these two points and moving my points in a normal direction to L if you want. And after we've moved our points, 
I would like to say that my line has also moved a little bit. Of course, it doesn't really move. It's, a, it's an infinitesimal perturbation. And let's summarize our findings after this fiddling around. Uh, I'm going to say that it really does look like fat points on the Grassmannian uh, seem to be an original line uh, together with a small perturbation in a point in a direction moving away from L. And remember, we did not move these points along L. Perhaps uh, what should be clarified is uh, the following point. What if I wanted to move my two points in a slightly different direction? So let me maybe write down this blue direction. So perhaps I want to move this first point along this blue arrow. Uh, the line I don't want to change. I want to get the same line. I'm just curious about what would happen. And what's happening is that the distinction between the orange arrow and the blue arrow, the distinction is essentially parallel, since my perturbation is infinitesimal, this difference is going to be parallel to the original line. And movement along the original line I could just cancel uh, by what the Graspanian is doing when it records a line as a pair of points, so that there would be no difference anyway. So that different ways of perturbing the line uh, can be done systematically by choosing this bij coordinates, which is what the Graspanian is doing. What I want to do now is to put what we've been doing with the fat points in the Grassmannian into a larger context. So we will talk about what it means to have a family of lines, so family of points in the Grassmannian, and uh, of course a special case of that would be a family of lines over the dual numbers, hence an infinitesimal family of lines. So this part is going to be the most technical part, but I think it's uh, worth listening to even if you are not comfortable with uh, spectrum and the project constructions. So first of all, let's define what it means to have a trivial family of Pn's, for example. I'm going to take the spectrum of a ring B. If you don't know what a spectrum is, think of it like a complex disk. You will not go wrong, it's fine. So let's say T is the spectrum of a ring. Uh, then Pn, B, also Pn times T, this product I'm taking over the spectrum of Z, the integers, if you really want to care. So then Pn times T, I will write PnB. And here, this PnB really is the proj of the ring, of the polynomial ring, in n plus 1 variables. So Pn has n plus 1 homogeneous coordinate functions. And that's really what it's saying, except our coordinate functions can now take values in B. So this is the trivial Pn bundle over T. So if T is not affine, so if it's not the spectrum of a ring, then the intermediate definition Pn times T, the product over spectrum of Z, is the trivial family of Pn over T. Let's generalize this a little bit. Let's talk about families that are not globally trivial, but families uh, of Pn's that are locally trivial. So what I want to say is that I have, you know, as with bundles, I have a map from P to T. So T is a scheme, P is a scheme. Uh, I have a map such that locally this map is a trivial Pn bundle. And this I will call a locally trivial Pn bundle. And the terminology here is that I'm going to take an open neighborhood of this any point. Uh, for any point there is a small enough open neighborhood. I can choose it to be affine, let's say spec B again such that the family restricted to this open set is going to be PnB. This is almost it. I also want some kind of niceness conditions when we're gluing these local trivializations, but I will not write this down. I just 
make sure that you, you're using the automorphisms of Pn when you're gluing different affine trivializations plus compatibility conditions. So the reason we had to define this is that uh, the definition of a family of lines is going to involve a family of P1s over some base. And now we know what to ask for. It seems the most natural thing to ask for is to have a locally trivial family of P1s. So I'm going to define a family of lines in P3 over T. So first of all, let's start with lines. So a family uh, of lines is going to be, at least geometrically, should be a family of P1s. So I write this as P over T. So this is a P1 bundle. And this P1 bundle should inject into P3, but I don't want my P3s to be locally trivial. I want my P3 to be globally trivial since P3, the ambient space, shouldn't be moving anywhere. So the first condition I said already is that P is a locally trivial P1 bundle. And the second condition is the lineless condition of P3, of being straight, of being defined by linear equations. And what this we can write down is that locally I have P1 bundle, trivial P1 bundle. Locally I have P3 on the other side. Linearless I can check by pulling back the coordinate functions of P3 onto P1. Uh, the pullback of coordinate functions should be linear. And that's how we can explain it also in this fancy context. So locally, let's take an open affine chart spec B in T. So openness I just write with this O over the inclusion sign. Write So I've uh, written my inclusion in these coordinates that I'm going to have due to trivialization. And now I'd say pullback of the coordinates on P3 should be linear in P1. Okay, so the only thing that we add is that the pullback of my coordinate functions are linear functions on P1, but the coefficients of this uh, linear expressions can be in B. So that gives a sense of movement to my lines because B can be complicated, B can have its own points, and when I specialize to these points of B, I would get different lines. So the highlight of this section is the following result. It says that points and the general version of a point is maps to G24 parametrize families of lines in P3. So let's write this down and then let's study what this means. The terminology for this is fine moduli space as opposed to a coarse moduli space. A fine moduli space has the following property. So what it parametrizes are lines in P3. So let's create this And to understand really the space structure of a moduli space, uh, you need to be able to vary the objects which it uh, parametrizes. So what I'm doing now is I'm talking about families of lines in P3 over any base T. And what we're saying is that there is a natural bijection between families of lines over T and the morphisms from T to G to 4. So morphisms as schemes, so T is a scheme and G24 is a scheme. If you really want, you can think of T as a maybe complex projective variety or an affine part of it, and G24 already has this complex structure, then you will have just holomorphic maps. This setup would also work. And a natural bijection just means the correspondence on both sides is functorial with respect to T. So I didn't talk about what it that means, but if I have a morph map to T, I can pull back a family of lines to get a new 
family of lines uh, at my new domain. And this construction allows also pullbacks of maps from T to G to 4. And if you do this pullback on both sides, the maps will commute. So that's what it means to be natural. It's, it seems like uh, all, this is very simple and that I'm not imposing many conditions. But when you say that all these maps are natural, uh, it actually is so restrictive that it completely determines G24. I mean, this is what, for example, this uh, theorem says that just uh, having a compatible family of lines, this is some kind of functor. This functor already represents G24. Therefore, the problem of parametrizing lines creates G24. This problem knows about G24. So if you want to interpret this result, one simple thing to do is to plug in T equals spectrum of a field, spec K, for example. Then the left-hand side are maps from spec K to G24, and you will realize that this is just K-valued points of G24. So left-hand side will be K-valued points. Right-hand side will be, well, just lines in P3. So we recover what we know already, that the K-valued points of G24 parameterize essentially K lines in P3. So lines defined over K in P3. You can also do this with field extensions of K. Everything works just as fine. So some simple things would be to take T equals spectrum of a univariate polynomial ring, such as KU or something. And uh, this would be also simple to analyze what this uh, bijection does. And we studied in the previous section the K epsilon points, so dual ring valued points of the Grassmannian. And we now know what's happening uh, within this framework. On the right-hand side, we have families of lines over the spectrum of the dual ring. So the spectrum of the dual ring has a single point uh, its geometry is not very complicated, but it has this thickened scheme structure, and that's what its uh, family ends up being. So the theorem that I wrote may seem a little bit fancy, just to go over the psychological barrier. Let me write down essentially the core of the proof, and you'll see that it reduces the tautology. So everything we've done already when we were studying lines and Grassmannians, you just do the same thing, but your variables and your numbers now have to be uh, elements of some other ring except your field. Aside from this, everything else is almost the same. There is a small trick. Uh, apart from this, you'll see that you could follow the proof, I think. So I'm going to take T to be spectrum of a ring. And to go back up to the general case is, again, essentially a triviality. But then if you know about schemes, you can do this yourself. If you don't, you don't care. So let's just T to be the spectrum of a ring. And another thing is that you might also care about B equals the dual numbers, and then you might just follow along with this uh, thought in mind. One important construction we need to do is to uh, switch to an affine chart of the Grassmannian, but now we have to be a little bit more clever. Uh, the, we had this first Plücker coordinate of the Grassmannian, where we were considering the first 2x2 two two minor of a 2x4 matrix, and previously we said the locus where this first minor is non-zero. Really what it means is that the first minor evaluates to something that is invertible in your field. So when operating with fields, this was fine. But now we're going to operate with other rings, and therefore the correct statement is to say that the first minor evaluates to something that is invertible in your ring, let's say B. And this is now the correct definition of the open locus of our off affine chart of the Grassmannian. And this is indeed isomorphic to A4. In particular, we can describe this home set morphisms from T to G0 uh, very clearly by this isomorphism to A4. So the B-valued points of the, this affine chart of the Grassmannian gives me just four tuples of numbers in B. And now let's write down how this gives us a line. You'll see that nothing has changed, at least uh, symbolically. So this gives me, so I pick a tuple, B1, <laughs> let's even call it B11, B12, B21, B22. This gives me a line. But that now I need to make sense of what this means. So in my context, I just need to define an injection from the trivial P1 bundle, so that, that will work, to the 
trivial P3 bundle over uh, T. And the description is that UV goes to the following. Now, actually, I've been a little bit sloppy because usually this notation says on the left hand side, take the point with coordinates UV inside of P1 and map it to the point with the following uh, coordinates UV, UB11, etc. Uh, this is not what it means when you're doing these general constructions or uh, schemes whose points are sort of negligent and don't see the whole structure, like when B is the dual numbers and points are just uh, k points maybe. But uh, what, what this notation really means here is that if you pull back the first homogeneous coordinate of P3, then you get the first homogeneous coordinate of P1. So x0 pulls back to u. Similarly, x1, let's say the other coordinate of P3, pulls back to v. x2 pulls back to this linear combination u times b11 plus v times b21. So the correct way to write it is Maybe I use x, y, z, w for the coordinates since that's what we've been doing. So x, y, z, w and now in fact when you describe what the pullback of coordinates functions are supposed to be this then just gives you the map from p1b to p3b. So this is algebra, algebraic geometry. The geometry is dual to algebra. I tell you what the algebra is supposed to be. The approach construction gives me the map. And this is then how I give you the line spanned by this four tuple. So the line corresponding to the four tuple, B11, B12, etc. I just described it to you. And this gives you then one part of the map. So this now gives you how B-valued points of this affine chart of the Grassmannian gives you a family of lines in P3, but with the condition that this first minor is invertible. So you can go back, but going back is a little bit tricky because you don't know a priori that your P1 bundle is trivial. It turns out it is trivial, but what you have to do is to understand what it means to have an invertible N12. So for the converse, let's take a family of lines inside of P3 over spec B again. Uh, now P is locally trivial, that's all we know. And I want to assume that the minor M12 is invertible. So this is then something of an exercise. When M12 is invertible, the following map is going to be an isomorphism. In P3, I have the xy axis. So the xy axis is where the x and y homogeneous coordinates are free and the other coordinates are zero. So let's say star star zero zero. Now, if I take this projection, this projection has to be an isomorphism. This is what the invertibility of M12 means. In particular, we end up trivializing our P because the XY coordinate is just a P1 over B. And this trivialization is canonical because our XY coordinate axis in P3 uh, inherits these coordinates already. It has its own coordinates and we borrow these coordinates to P. And now that's it. So if you are thinking with points, then uh, the images of 1, 0 and 0, 1 would go to 1, 0, B11, B12. The image of 0, 1 would go to 0, 1, B21, B22. And we recover our four coordinates, Pijs. Or if you want to think algebraically, which is what you should do in this context, now you pull back the other coordinates, D1, 
the remaining two coordinates really onto p which is trivialized and you look at the you read the coefficients and this will give you bij's So remember, we have already talked about what the pullback of the coordinates are over here. And when we pulled back the homogeneous coordinate Z and W, we got a linear combination of the original coordinate functions of the P1 bundle. So that would give us Bij's. And so you realize this we can do in this context as well. And this gives us the reverse map here. Someone has given me a family of lines with invertible first minor and I recovered four points in the Grassmannian, in this affine chart of the Grassmannian. To make things simple, I worked with this uh, affine chart, but many things are clear that you can patch together morphisms by the parts that land in one affine chart and then another affine chart, you can put them together so that just solving this problem on this affine chart actually allows you to solve it on the whole thing. But for this, you need to be able to patch things together, which is a standard construction. If you're familiar with schemes, you can do it. And if not, you don't care. This is all we need to know. This concludes our uh, proof fragment for understanding why the Grassmannian uh, actually parameterizes families of lines. We've also understood what it means to have a family of lines when the base is a more complicated object like the spectrum of the dual ring. And we saw that this corresponds to really just points of the Grassmannian say, over uh, this dual ring or whatever you want to plug in. We have not yet reached our goal. We're about halfway there. But I think this is a good point to stop for today. We will continue with the proof the next week. Remember, what we have done so far was to study fat points on schemes. We realized that it sees non-reducedness of isolated points, or it realizes that the scheme you are looking at is high dimensional, so it really cap is capturing tangent directions. Moreover, we briefly described what it means to have a fat point on the Grassmannian. Algebraically, this was very simple. But we were trying to interpret it geometrically and we realized it's like a line with a small perturbation. And then we studied points of the Grassmannian where point means point over any ring, any B-valued point of the Grassmannian and even any scheme-valued point of the Grassmannian. So that really means morphisms from a scheme to the Grassmannian. And we realized these always correspond to families over, over uh, your base scheme. What we did not do yet is to understand what happens if we were to limit the variation of lines onto a given surface S, and then we will realize that this relates to some normal bundle, and then we will have to compute the degree of this normal bundle. And this is the job for the next week. On Monday, we will not continue this proof. We will play around in magma, do some computational problems, especially we will real study projections, elimination problems, and within the context of lines in P3 again, and on Wednesday, we continue the proof. What we do on Monday will foreshadow what we will do then the following week. That's it for today. See you next week.